uh, for this uh, seminar series is Distinguished Women Researchers in the Built Environment. And indeed, today we have one of a distinguished member of this community, uh, Professor Suzanne Wilkinson. So let me introduce, uh, give a brief introduction to her uh, achievements thus far. Uh, Professor Wilkinson is uh, a Professor of Construction Management in the School for Built Environment at Massey University. And she's also Associate Dean for Research for College of Science at, at Massey. Uh, she has a PhD in construction management and a bachelor's honors in civil engineering, both from Oxford Brookes University, and a graduate diploma in business studies in dispute resolution uh, from Mass University. Uh, Suzanne's research focuses on resilience, disaster management, construction innovation, and smart cities. She is interested in how cities, communities, and organizations plan for disasters and manage hazard uh, events and has a particular interest in how cities, communities, and organizations rebuild and recover. Professor Wilkinson has been advisor to organizations on resilience building and disaster recovery, most recently including Auckland Council, government agencies in New Zealand, and Hunter Water in Australia. Uh, Suzanne has been principal investigator and research leader on many projects, including a recent five-year $10 million, 10 million New Zealand dollars project, which, uh, where she is the program lead on building capacity and capability for construction sector and a recently completed $4 million principal investigator for the urban theme in the National Science Challenge, uh, Resilience to Nature's Challenges. She has published over 300 research papers and co-written three books and most recently co-authored book uh, being Resilient Post-Disaster Recovery through Building Back Better. That's published by Rutledge in 2019. Uh, she wrote this book with colleagues Sandika Manakara and uh, Regan uh, Potangaroa. Sorry, <laughs> uh, Regan, I apologize for that. Uh, Suzanne is a keen PhD supervisor and has now supervised to completion over 40 PhD students. So with that said, Please welcome Professor Suzanne Wilkin. Suzanne, hmm. over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, just check, you can see my screen, the, just the title of the... Yes, we on, can. On the yeah. screen, yeah. Okay, then. So, hello, everybody, and um, thank you very much, Mark and Cole, for inviting me to this um, prestigious seminar series. Um, thrilled to be here. Uh, it's actually 5.30 in the morning in New Zealand, so um, got up especially early to talk to you, and hopefully um, you're here little bit about my career. So what, are we, what am I going to talk about? I think I'm going to talk about the highs and lows of a career in uh, construction management. What would I do differently if I was starting up again? So there might be people in the audience thinking about an academic career or a business career or where to go next. I think I'd also, I'm also going to talk about what, what I see as important research. So I'll talk about the research that I do and the work, the work that um, I consider particularly important. And then I'm going to touch on what, I, what I've experienced as a woman professor in construction or a woman in construction throughout my academic career. And they, it's mixed up. So you'll see different slides have different, a different flavor. So um, as we go through, you'll see different things. A little bit about me. Um, I'm not a New Zealander. I don't have a New Zealand accent. I actually have a London accent. I'm from London and was brought up in London until I went to university. And I think like a typical child, female child, trying to decide what to do, I had a, kind of a lot of choices. And I think those choices came down to history or engineering. I was really good at history, but I was lucky enough to have a physics teacher who said, I think engineering is going to be good for you. I don't think I was really well informed at the time, and I did love history, and I kept so I kept up history. I stayed right till the end of my sixth form study in history to keep my options open. But civil engineering won out. And I think I wasn't particularly well informed, and I think this is very common. I chose civil engineering for these three things. Primarily number three, it would lead to a job and they didn't quite know what history would lead to other than a history teacher. 
I, I really like skyscrapers and tall buildings. So I thought I would build skyscrapers. So I wanted to build things and I thought, hey, I could build skyscrapers. Actually, there weren't that many skyscraper buildings going on in and around Britain at the time. That subsequently came in the 90s after I'd left UK when they massively built up uh, the London in particular into our skyscrapers. So I kind of missed my opportunity there. But I thought also I like to be outside, so I like to work outside. I wasn't well informed about civil engineering at all. I had no idea, really. I didn't know the the whole breadth of civil engineering. And I, I'm not sure you need I needed to know that, but I think I wasn't I wasn't well informed. And at the time there was li limited internet. So you're talking about a time when there was no or limited internet. So what you, you had to find out things by going to this weird thing called the library. What was it like being a woman in construction and engineering in the late 80s and early 90s? I think I could kind of boil it down to these three things. There was underrepresentation. There was, I was in a class of three women and we were had about 60 men in the class. So that was the kind of ratio when I was doing civil engineering. Um, the opportunities and access, I think, were the main barrier at the time, I was lucky I had a physics teacher who said, you know, engineering will be really good for you. I, there were other women in my class who had a father who said it was really good for you or what they were following in the, the, their footsteps of somebody who had given them some access into, into engineering. And that, that still remains quite a common access route for women going into construction and engineering. But I think we've broadened our views much more. And then there were there just were no women around really in in engineering and construction, very few, no role models. I didn't have any women lecturers. Um, there were some women in psychology and on the arts faculty, but there were just no there were just no role models that you could kind of go, well, what's a career going to be? So you kind of a little bit on your own, but um, you know you make friends anyway, irrespective of of male, female, or any um, gender. You just make friends with people, and and we were a really good cohort in that year. Um, my degree had a had eighteen months out, so I went into industry, and I went onto onto a construction site. Just a little bit about construction sites at the time. The one you'll see is not a 1980s construction site. However, it does represent a 1980s construction site. So I, it's a fairly recent one, but it does look quite similar. So we had one computer and nobody knew how to use it. So it was basically sat in the corner. We hand wrote everything. We hand wrote reports. We hand wrote <clears throat> notes on site. We would, we would file those. We would... Um, give them to a receptionist and they would they would type out the important ones there were no mobile phones so imagine that you're on site and something happens you know you have to run to get the kit you can't you know you can't assemble people very quickly cameras were cameras so we took a lot of photos so we had to take photos of connections but there was no tagging those two parts of the building through a BIM model or anything like that. Basically, you just took photos. They then got processed. You then wrote on those photos what they were. Very much the beginnings of email internet, but not on this site because we, we only had one computer that nobody used. Somebody said they used it and some used to spend a bit of time on it, but I have no idea what they were doing because I don't think it was really connected. <laughs> And at the time, architects were really important. So we had, I was on a site where the architect's coming, and I think that's quite a shift now. And the architect would come along and would be doing things like checking all our documentation, walking around site, but it was, we cleaned up the site, we got prepared for the architect's visit. They never visited just as an architect, you know, they never just showed up, there was always, you know, this big intake of breath and the architects visiting and we would get like ready for this royal visit. So um, even th so I felt that, you know, probably I should have gone into architecture <laughs> because they were getting all the all the praise. Um, machinery was uh, much the same at the time. So you'll see this site, you know, with planes and diggers and trucks, much the same delivery system, um, 
supply chain type activity without the digital overlay. So I think there was fairly similar in the ways of construction. Um, the We weren't doing modern methods of construction, which I think has moved on, but essentially we were, we were building as we would build now. And the thing, thing about being female in a male dominated world, I think was, it was quite confronting. That it's the only female on site, the only female I'd ever been on site that a lot of people had seen. And just, just low level confronting behavior around, what are you doing here? Is this the right place for you? Not quite sure you could, you know, you're given instructions, but they weren't quite sure they could take instructions from you. These, this is kind of low level, but the higher level stuff was really around the office had total nude calendars of women. So that was a bit, a bit, a bit shocking, which I did ask as a, you know, I asked to, for them to be removed and they didn't get removed. And so, um, so basically what happened subsequently was I, got them removed through head office and that was um, that was an unpopular move for me on the construction site those sorts of things i think were kind of more of the higher level things which you wouldn't see now but the lower level stuff i think still there's still an undertone of what are you doing here what makes a difference is actually having a critical mass on the site so if you have two or three or four women on the site they're much better than having one woman on the site, and I still think that's probably true. So I completed my PhD in in the early nineties, and I I kind of thought, how what am I going to do next? And the, the the industry was quite buoyant at the time, so I thought, well, and I was being offered a PhD scholarship, and I was being offered a PhD at the same institution. I was quite happy to do that, and I, but I wasn't quite sure. So this is how I made a decision. I loved being a student, so there's a positive there. I thought the lifestyle was great. I could do what I wanted. It was sold to me as go away and explore. I think you'll enjoy this and got three years of being a student again. You can explore what you like, and I really like that. So I like the student lifestyle. I liked being a student, but I think the, the number one thing was my partner was doing a PhD. And that meant that we collectively, you know, as a couple could still live the lifestyle we had been living as students. So we met as students and we're still together. So that, that was probably a good choice. But I think I missed other things. I think when I was weighing it up, because it was a very, very close decision for me, as whether to kind of go into a consultancy company. I really liked geotechnical engineering and I, thought, well, there's an alternative choice. But I think doing the degree, it was quite a hard choice for me. Doing a PhD was quite a hard choice for me. But I think in the end, the lifestyle side of that and another, another kind of three years of doing what I wanted to do really kind of won out there. So just thinking about what I'd do differently, so I think during my PhD, I would make more connections within, with industry. I think that's one of the big things that makes a difference because it still leaves your options open as a PhD student. So I think I didn't make many connections when I was doing my PhD. And I, and I think that that would have given me a much wider focus on the industry and a much bigger understanding of what the industry was all about. And the second thing I continued into my PhD from my undergraduate degree and basically um, went straight to the same university. And I think I probably would choose a different, different university. And I'll come back to why I choose a different university a bit later. But look at look at what the highs were. I mean, it was great fun. I loved it. I really loved doing a PhD. You know, great colleagues. I was in a room of six or seven other PhD students and we were all doing different things and we all we just had a lot of fun still in contact with some of those colleagues not all of them um that discovery and freedom was fantastic I loved it I loved being out in the library and reading and finding out things and just basically nosying around the place which was great I did some lecturing at the time which I also started to do 
um, which gave me some experience. The lifestyle proved to be really good. But one of the highs that came through during my PhD was the conferences. I started going to conferences quite early on, and I think that made such a difference to what I knew about the research industry and what I knew about being an academic. The lows, sometimes you got no money. I think everyone who's done a PhD would know about that. That so can be a considerable low. Um, the envy of others, I think for me it was, all my colleagues who had done civil engineering degrees, some of them were doing some really cool stuff. They were working around the world. They were working in other places. They were just generally doing some really cool buildings. And I kind of missed that because I kind of thought, oh, you know, maybe I should have done a couple of years doing, the, you know, the great OE working in Indonesia or Hong Kong or France where these people were. A lot of them were in the UK, but many of them headed overseas. So there was an alternative lifestyle that I could imagine at the time that I wasn't having. However, I was still having a great time doing a PhD. But I think one of the big loads which you'd understand as PhD students, if you do a PhD or doing a research degree, is around the confusion, the hard slog, the will I ever finish? So that always, I think, is embedded in the whole process of a PhD because it just takes time. And you think... Three years is quite a long time, and a lot of them go beyond three years. This is what my PhD was in. So it was kind of like it actually was in women, women in civil engineering. It was nothing to do with disaster management at all. Um, I did a, a PhD which looked at choices made by women civil engineers leaving higher ed education. And at the time, there were 362 women civil engineers in the whole country leaving education that, that year. So um, I learned a lot of things around employment law. I learned loads of social science methodologies around case studies and questionnaires, statistics. I had six months in the, in the US while I was doing my PhD, which was great. I looked at a, a international comparison, did, did a, lot around, a lot around diversity and inclusion, and looked at different, just looked at the whole structure of the industry and how it was working and who did what and where they went and why they chose to do what they were what they wanted to do. So it was great for kind of really understanding how that industry works and how human resources in the industry worked. But I think I mostly learned about the process of research because I was in a shared office and they were doing geotechnical structures, computer science. I think I mostly learned from my peers about this, you know, what are they doing? How are they doing it? You know, having fun, understanding those sorts of things. And I, and I had three supervisors. So I had a psychology supervisor, a supervisor in architecture and a supervisor in civil engineering. And that gave me a really broad kind of canvas to work with. And they didn't agree at all amongst themselves. So it was kind of quite a confusing time, but that was good because it meant I took courses in psychology, I took courses in structures and architecture, and um, and I could, and I could I did some lecturing in basic construction management at the time. So it was a really good time for me, and I really enjoyed and really appreciated being at Oxford Brooks. And Oxford Brooks at the time were really gearing up their research, so they were really putting energy into their PhD students. So we were being sent to conferences and basically given like a really good education. I felt I came out with a really good education. But I think the thing, reason why I might have changed universities was because of this. The construction management research in the 1990s in UK was basically dominated by three institutions, mainly. I mean, there were scatterings elsewhere, but you you even needed to be in Reading, Salford and Loughborough. And I noticed that if you were in those organisation, in those um, universities, you would probably get jobs because the interchange of people between those, it was quite a big, it was quite an obvious move. People would move between these institutions or the PhD students would get jobs in one or other of those institutions. And it was pretty much led by a very small number of academics. And this is a list of academics. And I, in the red, I went and chased them down because having left the UK a long time ago, I don't really kind of keep in touch with all of them. 
Um, but I did it did with some of them, but you'll see they really st still seem to have stayed in Loughborough and Reading, certainly the people that I knew knew well. And um, Martin Skidmore in particular was at Salford, but moved across to QUT and lived and still is now at Bond. Uh, but my supervisor, one of my supervisors, just encouraged me to go to these leading institutions. And so occasionally I'd go to their seminars, I'm very close to Reading. And Will Hughes in particular was just extremely, ha was extremely helpful with new PhD students. Um, and there's lots of others. I can't remember everybody, but these were people that I kind of remember, was trying to remember at the time who were helpful or who were giving advice to young PhD students. I thought that was really, really excellent, a very nice um, group of people. So if you know about ARCOM, this is what ARCOM looked like in the 1990s. So if you ever go to ARCOM now, it's a slick, well-organized, big conference, limits the number of papers that, that it takes, um, but basically everyone wants to go to ARCOM. Uh, it's now a big international conference. Um, but in the 1990s, it was a small bunch of people. And you'll see in this photo, I managed to track this photo down from, a, from an ARCOM newsletter of 1994. Now, there was only one woman in this photo, but I was actually at this conference. But that woman there with the red circle is not me. I think it's Helen Lingard. But I was at this conference, and I think we were the only two women at the conference. I certainly don't recall any more. However, the conference wasn't huge. This is this was the conference. And you'll see Martin Skidmore's number two on the on the right, but I can't quite put names to everybody. It's a bit blurred there. So I went to the Isle of Man conference, the eighth annual ARCOM conference, and then I went to the Oxford one, which is where this conference picture was taken. And I can't kind of stress the value of conferences in your early stages. As a researcher, you don't really you don't really know much, and so you go to these conferences, and you're a bit overwhelmed by the everything going on, but you really pick up some great ideas and some great tips and see what's current and all those kinds of great things that makes you more of a rounded researcher. To time traveling. So at the end of the 90s, the end of my PhD in 94, we decided we didn't want to be in Oxford anymore. We could have been in Oxford for the rest of our lives because both of us were being offered jobs. But we wanted to go traveling. And I think that was kind of a common thing in the in, for people in their late 20s. In fact, I've got three children and they've all gone traveling. So post COVID build up of need to travel. I understand that because I did that in the in 1994. And it was supposed to be a short trip. It was supposed to be go to New Zealand for three years. Let's have a look around New Zealand and Australia. And then let's just come back to the UK and we'll kind of, I think we would restart our lives in the UK. So, you know, we'd probably go back somewhere in and around Oxford and we'd, you know, maybe I could get a job at Reading, maybe I could get a job kind of locally around there, maybe London. But it certainly was supposed to be a short trip. But I ended up, first of all, here, which is what was called Carrington Polytechnic, but it's now Unitech for two years as a researcher. And then an opening came here, which is the University of Auckland. And I just stayed there. I just thought this is a cool place to be. Really enjoyed my time at the University of Auckland. And I just stayed there for years and years and years and didn't leave. There's another reason why I didn't leave, which I'll come up, come up to. And then more recently, 2019, I moved to Messi to a, because it was a brand new school being built and a brand new school, lots of energy, new, lots of new young people coming in. So I thought there's an opportunity to help build a new school. So I've, which I've really enjoyed, I think. After being so long at the University of Auckland, I knew where all the bugs were. I actually could, I actually could go to work with my slippers on. That's what it felt like. It felt like I really knew my job so well that there wasn't anything new that was challenging me. But as I've moved into Massey, I've been, yeah, definitely found that I've had more challenges in the last few years than I had probably in quite a number of years previously. Um, what else can I say? Going back to research. So first independent research was in 1994. So just finished my PhD. 
And Unitech were not interested in women in engineering at all. So the message was, we'd quite like you to be a researcher here. We'll give you a position. Unitech were trying to become a university. So they needed to have a lot of PhD people there. So they hired in a whole load of people with PhDs, didn't quite know what to do with us. And so they just said, well, we'll just give you lots of projects. So my project was procurement and life cycle costing in New Zealand. And so you, so you can see I suddenly switched because that's what I was you know, being asked to do. So I think if I'd thought about it at the time, I would have carried on publishing in with in my published my PhD more widely. And the reason was I think I left a lot of my PhD didn't it just didn't get published. It got published in conferences, it didn't get the wider audience, and it and the subject area became really more and more popular as I moved away from it. And so I only really published one paper and then went into lecturing and was working more mainstream construction management. And I think I'd also get more training. Oh. Looks like we have lost Professor Wilkinson. Uh, I think she would join in. Well, let's give a few minutes. Oh, there you are. Be, uh, Suzanne, you're on mute. Sorry, my internet just went off completely. So I'm not sure really what happened there. I can restart my, where I was. <laughs> Sorry yeah, absolutely. That. Yeah, no, no worries. It just went black. My my screen just went blank, and I was like, "Oh no, what's happened here?" Ooh. So can everyone see that? Not yet, no. Okay, well, um, I come to Zoom and share screen. Another screen to share. Apologies about this. We have a look. Happened here. So, am I back on now? Uh, yeah, it's coming up. Uh, no. <laughs> am I back on? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I can see your screen. Okay, sorry about that. My screen just went black, and I was just like, oh, that's. That's really um, that's really hard. <laughs> so, right, I'm coming back. So where I was, I'm gonna. So I should just start from where I was. Yeah, you're happy for me to kick off again. So um, so just talking about the first independent research, and it was in the in a place called Unitech, and at the time, they were trying to be a university. And I was asked to do some lecturing there, and I was just thrown into construction contracts and project management. 
in first year classes. And I really found that absolutely terrifying. So I think the other thing I really encourage people to do would be to get some more training or get training. So make sure that you really do know how to go into, how to lecture, how to do these kinds of things. But I think just know the fundamentals of your discipline. So obviously this is not all the fundamentals of the discipline, but just know the basics of what's going on in your discipline in the in the wider construction management discipline. Because even though you might be teaching a niche area, you still need to have that overview of how do your things connect to what's going on. Spend some time talking to construction employers, construction managers, people on site to really get a sense of how your your discipline connects. I think there's much more activity now than there was at the time around doing that, doing work with industry and working and understanding more broadly. In terms of the barriers for women, I think they still remained. Certainly in the, in the 1990s, they were getting better. And I think we were beginning to see more women going into engineering, more of a drive, more of, more of a drive for women going into construction, access and encouragement. I think the schools were starting to do a bit more. And certainly around this time, I did a lot of work with schools. So I would go into schools, talk about construction, talk about civil engineering. I think there was some discrimination in the workplace. You quite often see um, reports around unequal pay, lack of support, mobility within the sector. And also, I think we still lacked role models. So there's still very few. I was the first woman a civil engineer to be employed at the University of Auckland in their civil engineering department. We had a few more come after me. Still not great numbers. So I think there was still this lack of where, where is all the people that I can get some advice from? And things were starting to get better. And I think they gradually got better because we got more aware that we needed to do something. And so we did a lot, certainly at the university, a lot to promote engineering more broadly and civil engineering um, particularly. So we did have teams that would work with schools and work with junior staff to improve the role of women. There were lots of initiatives going on at the time around STEM there was also beginning to see some networks. So this is the first time uh, at NAWIC, which is the National Association of Women in Construction, it was just starting to be convened in New Zealand. And so the professional development opportunities and networks they were just starting up. There were still few women in leadership roles and so few staff, none of them were in leadership positions. And I think a lot of women academics were getting themselves into service roles. And I think that was one of the things that happened quite frequently, less so now, but certainly at the time I saw other women in other faculties, they, they were doing a lot of the service roles and weren't really talking about their research. So I think there was quite a divide at the time, but it gradually got better as we kind of shone a light on the things that were happening around you know, leadership, promotion, um, I think the universities took took quite a lead in that. So for me, 97 to 2002, I think it was all about learning the subject. So I did some work on life cycle costing, did some work on looking at architecture and engineering education, and the, uh, the lecturing got better and better as you get more and more used to it. And I wrote a textbook, but really for my own benefit, which was really my notes, but it seemed that lots of other people wanted copies of my notes. So a colleague and I turned it into a textbook. So we had a, wrote a textbook, in this textbook in 2003. It was repeated in 2010. So this is the front cover of the second edition. And we're just coming out with a third edition. So there's obviously still a need for a basic textbook for people who can just go and go, oh, that's what it's about. So, and this is written very much with that, with me in mind, what did I want to know at the time? And what didn't I know and going out and researching that. So my colleague and I, Roseby, who was in architecture, we, we teamed up and we still, we've just finished our third edition. 
So I've got to give a shout out to CIB since this is a CIB organized organized um, conference, uh, organized seminar. Uh, the the good thing about CIB is this international focus. Remember what I said about Arcom, but it was very much a UK based organization. We had a similar one. We have a similar one here called Orbia, which is really kind of regional construction management and education. But CIB for me opened a completely different world. So I've attended these five CIB conferences, but I've had papers in many other conferences and events. So the sideline events, that have, if they've been regional, then I've tended to go to them. And yes, I'm hoping to come to the 20, 25 Purdue one. So um, I've got my ideas for papers and things and on the scientific committee. So thank you very much, Mark, for inviting me. Um, but I, yeah, shout out for CIB for me as a young member so i've been part of an institutional membership since 1994 and that was unitech so unitech were really forward thinking in terms of their connections they had a good person there who was really outward looking really wanted to make unitech a great institution for construction management and so cib was one of those vehicles that it joined and made us all join and participate in so what does it give you? It gives you those net international networks. Colleagues internationally, I still work with people I've met at the first CIB conference. A quick what's what, who's who, who's doing what, and all those big topics and big picture thinkers that well, the website gives you access to all these people. And more recently, we did a tour of the UK with our research project, and we looked on CIB to see, okay, who's where? Right, well, we want to go to Leeds. You know, we wanted to go to Leeds Beckett. Okay, we'll co contact Mohammed there. We want to go we want to go to Wolverhampton. Okay, we'll contact them the person there in Wolverhampton. We wanted to go to uh, London. So who's who's in CIB and who's been in CIB and where are they and what are they doing? So this is a great way for a quick hit on what's going on in your area. And you just get so many curious people working. So that's kind of a great place to to look at these these you know who's doing what and, and work with those really curious people. But I had complicated my life completely by two thousand and one because I had three children by then, and um, that just totally and utterly complicates life. But I wouldn't have it any other way because they're amazing, as everybody every mother would say about their children. Um, but it does mean a halt or a slowdown or a rethink about your career. So for me, it was work-life balance, impossible with, you know, with toddlers to really accelerate your career. Uh, hats off to anybody who can do it. I barely kept alive, let alone keep a career going. Childcare at the time wasn't great. It was very, very expensive. Luckily, we could afford it because we had two incomes, but would have no idea how you would do it if you didn't have two incomes. Um, career progression slowed. I think it definitely slowed at the time because I couldn't do I couldn't do the travel and I couldn't do the connections. There's a lot of things I didn't want to do because I wanted to be home with the children. It was a conscious choice, and I think there wasn't that much support because people just didn't understand that women wanted to work and have children. And it was not, a, and they didn't necessarily want to take big breaks. I did take six months off with each child. And each time I felt that it was, that was enough to, if I took any more time off, I would start losing currency within the organization. But if I, so I didn't take more than six months off. And I saw a reduction in opportunities. So people, didn't really kind of ask me to do things, you know, especially around the research space. Satisfaction, you know, I really was on autopilot teaching. I think you just got to recognize that you can only do as much as you can do. And if you've been up all night with sick toddlers and you've got an eight o'clock in the morning lecture, you're not going to be your best. And there was a lot of juggling. And for me, it was colleagues who, not in my own faculty, because there were so few of us with children, uh, there were more in other faculties. So I made friends with women in arts, women in science, women in 
um, law, women in health, and they became my cohort because they all had children and they their children were going to the crash. So I learned, I met them regularly and we talked about how to survive and we, we just created this cohort of people who would support each other and that was absolutely fabulous. So I kind of saw, you know, the world saw me like this. So this is one of my meetings where I would go to, and this is actually a trip I did do to Korea. Basically, I felt like this most of the time, just totally and utterly, what on earth is going on and completely frazzled. So, And that lasted, I think, for quite a while. Um, and so for me, it meant a conscious decision to focus on family, to make sure I had enough friends. I had no family other than my immediate husband and children in New Zealand um, so friends became very very important a good friend friends network and research so teaching I could do and I didn't need to kind of I didn't feel I needed to get teaching awards and do fabulously at teaching I think I was just okay at it so I was happy to let that continue as it was but I wanted to keep my research career going and in 2003 a new opportunity came up now, this was really interesting because it wasn't something I was going to do. What happened here was I was in a lift and I knew that there was this big meeting going on about a big funding body and they wanted to look at disaster recovery. And I was in a lift and somebody in the lift said, you need to come to this meeting. And I said, no, no it's not for me. I'm going home. You know, I've got other things to do no, no, you definitely need to come to this meeting because you're the only person with construction management experience. And we need somebody who might be able to do that in a disaster environment. I went, oh, yeah, you know, well, that sounds quite interesting, actually. I'll come along. And that set me on a completely different path. Up to that point, I'd been doing procurement, contracts, construction management more generally, looking at the role of the industry and the changes in the industry. And suddenly I was in a in a leading part in a five-year multi-party, multi-institution, government-funded project, looking at construction industry, the role of the construction industry and disaster recovery. And so it was just fabulous. It was just the most interesting research that I've that I got into. And it was useful and it was People were listening to us, there were interesting topics, and there was a lot of security about around having a five-year funded project because it meant that other things you could kind of let go. So I could buy out of my teaching, for instance. And also my youngest child was only two at the time, so it gave me five years of security where no one was going to get rid of me because there was so much money coming in. So I was kind of, I kind of felt quite protected then. A uh, great, a great time for me. Um, and 2003, these, since 2003, that's really what I've been spending my time doing, which is why there's all those papers on the um, Google Scholar are all on this, disaster recovery, but all about construction and how construction works in a disaster environment. So even though we're looking at climate adaptation, we're looking at it with a view to looking at how does the, how does infrastructure get inf affected? How, what does the building industry contribute to climate adaptation? How do we build smart cities? It's all about the construction side for me, about the industry and what does it do? What does it do? And how is it? How is the industry affected by shocks and stresses? Which is really the more recent work that we've been looking at. And so some of the common things we're, do we're doing. Here's one looking at um, collaboration and communication. And, and who 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 does what and when does when's communication needed and and how does how are the structures sorted set set up is one that we're doing around some engineering maps and flood hazards and climate change impacts so some modeling these were two of my colleagues here Widi and Mohammed and here's one that we've just been doing just finishing off with as in a PhD around um, vulnerability of of tourists to tsunamis. So looking in particular at tsunami evacuation routes, looking at what types of structures need to be built in order to protect the population of Napier from, from a tsunami and what kinds of warning systems do they need do they need and how do they need to get what how do you build those? 
And these are other kinds of things that we've been working on recently around some recent papers. Mark mentioned our 2019 book, but we've also been working on carbon emissions for buildings and cyclone resistant housing in Fiji. So a whole range of areas around climate disasters, disaster recovery, trying to make the world better. And I think we've gradually seen a lot more improvements in women in engineering and construction. So I don't think we're seen as odd or different anymore. I think in the eighties we were. I think the options are similar and encouragement and choices to go into engineering has definitely improved. There's, there's much more support within the workplace and more women in leadership positions more visible. And I think that's just, there's really made a difference to younger women coming through and, and, uh, and other staff members coming through the, 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 the lecturing positions because they can see a whole variety of people that they wouldn't have seen you know, 20 years ago it would have been very different. I think there's a value of diversity now that in all workplaces that wasn't there before and flexibility in the workplace. So there's much more flexibility and acceptance around, for instance, having children and working. Some of the issues that I still see are in particular women not supporting women. I think there's a, a need for still a need for these kind, kinds of groups to come together and to talk about issues that they may be that they may be facing. Maybe, you know, cultural groups coming together or di different diverse groups coming together and just talking about some of these issues. There's still a big pay gap, pay gap in New Zealand, which drives me nuts. Um, so it's 10% different still for women in engineering and construction. And there's different expectations after having children. So there's an expectation that you will slow down. But I don't necessarily think with that that is the case now. I think that, that families operate in multiple ways and there's a, a lot more acceptance of how families are going to operate in different ways and with the flexible working it's not you don't need to have those different expectations I don't think they that I think they exist but they're not they're not real I think uh, that they're, they're, they're the equivalence of of the work is 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 obvious um, the best part of my job is really now is supervising PhD students. So all these people are my PhD students, and some of them are professors now. So Kareel, um, James and Temi are all professors, and some of them are heading really exciting projects. Uh, Mustafa and Alice are both really excellent for, for that. They're in industry. They're basically industry leaders. And as in my uh, student down on the right hand side with my colleague Mustafa, uh, just amazing student seems to win every prize and every certificate and every cup going. So, and she's now heading some work for the for for our regional council and doing some really great stuff. So that's the best part of the job by far. You know, the fact that I've created from a family of me and my partner and our three kids, I have a huge family now. And they're all over the world and they're all all around the place. And that I, that is such a pleasure. And what's important is how my work and the work of the team affects and improves society. So we now do more public contributing to public debates. I think getting into public debates and putting your work out there, it comes with risks, but it also comes with advantages and it's it's really good to see when someone reads your when a lay person reads your piece of work and comes back and says hey I've got something to tell you or I want to connect or I want to have coffee and it just gives you a real kind of buzz that somebody is looking and listening and using your work so our work has got into policy we've done consulting and then we do we put out these kind of 800 words through the conversation primarily or through our local building magazines and the worldwide career so the most one of the big pleasures is is the interactions that you have and these were these are just recent interactions that we've had with people either collaborating or uh, inquiries about collaborating and that's been amazing so I just plotted those I think this is the last six months and I thought I'll plot them on to see where where and 
how we're doing things with people. And it, it just looks really good. We've got a worldwide reach, and I think academics can have that reach, and it's well, our lives are richer for it. Another big thing for me is how I support and mentor other staff. So I do a lot of mentoring now, spend a lot of time talking to younger staff, encouraging them, working out what, how to, talking to them about their careers, what are they wanting to do, structuring, helping them structure things out. And that's a real pleasure. And the world turns. So I recently went back to this year to the UK, found it didn't do civil engineering, but it does disaster management. So I feel like, well, isn't that a real coincidence? <laughs> So I think that's the end of my my talk, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. That was that was wonderful. Uh, you know, walking with you through your journey of life in in academia. That was really uh, really interesting. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let me open it for questions. I'm sure from our audience they must be uh, wanting to ask questions. So please uh, open your mic and go ahead. I cannot see everybody on my screen, but uh, uh, you know, if you have a question, please go ahead. Well, uh, while people are thinking about questions to ask, let me let me jump in with my my question. So, you know, you you, you mentioned about uh, uh, the changes that have happened uh, in in the past years and and what you have seen through your career, and uh, so based on your experience, uh, you know, what would you suggest? Uh, universities need to do or workplaces need to do to attract more uh, women talent uh, in whether that be in academia or or in industry? So part of the answer I think is around the entry into construction and engineering. I think the numbers are pretty good but what seems to be happening is as they get into a career they're starting to be lost in that career and they they leave they leave construction and engineering, and I think the bigger the bigger thing is how do we keep keep them on a women in the on on a track within construction? What's the what's the attrition rate if there's a problem there? How do we address it? And the second thing, like for me, it was I went on the women in leadership program, and that was really really useful. So to actually do some proper thinking about career, your career and how it might develop. I think those kinds of training programs are really useful. And it's about creating a culture that people want to belong to. If, if, it, if the workplace is, un, is unwelcoming, then why would you want to be there? There's other options. So, so it's about creating a, a, a kind of workplace that is welcoming and that has diversity. Uh, Arka, you have a question. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, so uh, thank you, Professor Wilkinson. That was a great presentation. So as you mentioned, you have been part of the disaster research for uh, almost 20 years now. So I am also uh, graduating from Purdue with, and my research also looked at uh, disaster recovery and disaster response mitigation as well. So I wanted to uh, know about your opinion about where this particular uh, field of research going in the future because you know all the different universities in different continents and as well as countries are looking at this problem so what's your opinion on that thank you so a couple of things i think one is to keep your main keep your core so did you do you have a construction or engineering background yes so, yeah so i think so i think the strength the strength I see is to have a core that you relate that core to other disciplines and you become much more broadly marketable as a as a person in terms of getting a career. So if you can go into construction, in, into a construction or an engineering faculty, if you want to be a, an engineer, in, if you sorry, if you want to be an academic, that's an option. That, that's that that's a wide option for you because almost all of the universities are interested in climate, disaster, disaster response, big world problems, global issues. 
and they gradually morph into being much more holistic in the way that they do engineering. So there's a core engineering that you can contribute to or core construction discipline that you can contribute to, but you're also part of the future thinking. And I think that's that the, there's, a, there's positions that are coming up around that future, around that multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary work that you, you would be right at the front of. And so to look for that, look for those forward thinking universities that have that, where they're consciously developing disaster recovery, climate, uh, zero carbon work. And I think a lot, a lot of, a lot of them are doing that now. Great. Thank you, Arka, for that question. Do you have any follow up on that or? No, I'm good. Thank you. That was okay. a great response. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wants to go next? Well, so then just to just to follow up on what, what Arka was talking about, uh, you know, he's he's doing work in the role of insurance uh, companies in in uh, disaster mitigation and disaster support. So he has done some work related to that. But you you mentioned earlier when you were talking about your research uh, recent work uh, about shocks and stresses uh, to improve resilience of of communities or or how to identify shocks and stresses that would influence resilience of communities. Uh, could you expand on that? I know we have discussed that bit, but I think that's a very fascinating piece of work that you've done. Yeah, so the piece of work is um, is currently looking at how the, what, what are all the types of shocks and stresses that we have? So we're not just looking now at the standard ones like earthquakes and flooding and tsunamis, those kinds of things. We're now looking more broadly at what's affecting the sector. So financial, political, technological, any disruption that affects the sector to work with the, the sector to try and make it more resilient. So understanding what did they do in the global crisis, for instance, financial glo global crisis, how similar is that to what they did in COVID? Or how similar is that to what they would do if they had an event that affected their business uh, power outage for two or three weeks. And so we're looking at the shocks that, to, to an organisation, plus we're looking at the stresses. We're trying to understand what are the commonalities between those in order to start building resilience around those issues, those more those, com those common features. Because what, what we find is when there's a disaster, the kind of rules get rewritten each time. And everybody kind of scrambles to kind of get into trying to, un trying to understand what are, what are they supposed to do. The construction industry go, hey, well, we're, we're going to be rebuilding. But they don't really know what that means or how, how to do it or what the complications are around that. And so we're trying to build knowledge and resilience in the system so that they will go. We understand We've been through this before. We know what the commonalities are. We can we can now use that knowledge to improve how we recover from events. So that's where we 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 are with that piece of work. Okay, no, that that's great. Yeah. I, I thought that was quite a fascinating piece of work. Because of course, that leads into you know how to build capacities and and uh, in what different sectors do we need to build capacities to improve the resilience as well. Yeah, um, correct. Let me see, Did, uh, you know, please raise your hand, the virtual hand, and so you, your window pops up right in, uh, in the first place. So I know you have a question. Well, I have a follow-up question. <laughs> so, you know, you, 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 uh, but your, your talk was about uh, you know your your life and journey through academia, uh, being a women researcher. So now coming fast forwarding to 2023, uh, you know there's a lot of emphasis on work life balance and and so on. Have you have you seen that affecting academia and in in a positive way or also industry in New Zealand, uh, where where you know the issues that uh, you had mentioned are being addressed so that there's equal opportunity for everybody. Yeah, I think I think the good thing that I've seen is the flexible working policies. 
that uh, institutions now have, that creates a, a, a kind of culture that you don't have to be nine to five, that you can work at different times. The um, off, off site working as well, so the work from home, I think that's really, really useful. It's not for everybody, but I think some, you know, that flexibility has created opportunity, more opportunities, I think, to keep your research and your work going when when you're trying to balance other other things. I mean, you know, it's not just children, it's kind of elderly parents with kind of colleagues dealing with sick relations, elderly parents, you know, everyone has these things that happen in their lives. They're usually temporary. Then and and we ought to accept that during that temporary time, they may not be as productive, but they're going to be more productive later because they're going to be so happy that you've supported them. You know, so the so people people want to do their best on the whole. And sometimes you can't do your best because your external circumstances affect that. And we need to just accept that everybody's life has when I mean, you see mine, it has ups and downs and you know, changes of direction and all those kinds of things. It's just an it's just an ordinary life. And I think everybody has that. So to know that your colleagues that are going through some things that they need support for at times, and they will then that they'll pay that back in dividends because when you need support, they'll be there. And I think that's a really a real shift. I think from the early days like the 80s and 90s when it was very much a nine to five or you know a kind of boxed in approach to work I think the flexibility the work-life balance the career breaks they're not affecting careers as much as they you know the, the career breaks are not affecting careers as much as an acceptance of them yeah we have made some structural changes in that regard also at, at Purdue and that that has really uh, been quite quite good approach, but in terms of uh, you know research funding, uh, have you seen any uh, uh, shortfall for women researchers in in acquiring research funding in uh, New Zealand or uh, other parts of the world where you have been? Yeah, I think that's a well. I've read things and and I think that there's a there's a bit of a problem there. I think with li women leading major grants i still think there's a kind of less they're less likely to win major grants and i don't know why that is but um it, yeah i i can't i haven't got an answer for it i just think it's something to watch and to think about and to and to analyze and to bring up and say is this a structural thing is there some in, inherent discrimination in a system or is it just that we just, you know, we don't have enough women bidding? I mean, we're certainly doing a lot of work at Massey to get the the women staff bidding for grants and running grants. And I've had in my role as associate dean is part of that is to kind of say this grant is one that you should be going for. And it's the similar with promotions. You know, we know that the women only go for a promotion when they're absolutely ready, whereas my male colleagues, and I see this all the time, they will still go for a promotion when they're not ready and they'll just chance it, but they'll get the feedback and they'll get the recognition that they're ambitious and forward thinking. And so it's about saying to women staff, put your application in, put it in early, get that feedback, get that recognition that you're ambitious. You'll probably get it the following year then. You might not get it the following year if you're waiting till you're absolutely perfect. So you could miss another year. So this is, you know, these are the kinds of conversations that that we have. And women, so, some some people, women and men, they might go, well, actually, I'm not going to take that advice. I'm still really cautious and I need all the boxes ticked. Fine. But that's that's OK. But we do notice that there is a difference there and that, that, that we can do something about it by providing that encouragement and support. So we have a number of uh, women researchers in the audience today. Uh, so, you know, please, if you have any questions, uh, uh, please raise your hand or just open your mic and, and go ahead and ask the question. Uh, and while you're thinking, let me ask, and like, oh, okay, so Majid, go ahead, please. I'll hold my question, go ahead. 
Uh, hi, uh, that's a great presentation. I have a personal question. Uh, so if you were to go to go back in time, would you choose a different career path, like uh, going to a to the industry, or would you even consider going to a different specialty other than civil engineering? Yeah, it's a great question and one that I think about, you know, reasonably often. Um, there were there were forks in the road, and I could have taken any fork, any different fork, and I think I would have been happy with with a different career. So I think I would have been happy with a civil engineering career, and certainly the colleagues who did civil engineering, the two women who did civil engineering with me, the one of them is a um, is very senior in a in an engineering company in the UK, and doing very well, and really loves the loves the role. And has had to again struggle through different things, through children and changing jobs and changing careers. But when I look at her and I think, oh, she's got a great life. I think, well, I also have a great life. So it's kind of hard to know, right? You kind of take a pathway and you hope for the best. I wish I'd built a skyscraper. I don't. I, that would have been cool. It would have been cool to be able to say, look, I built that building. That would have been pretty cool. But then what's the sacrifice I would have had to make to do that would have been pretty huge, I think. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have come to New Zealand if I was gonna build in London, for instance. I would have had a very different life. So, you know, you can always pose these questions to yourself. I mean, overall it's been a fantastic career. It's great to be in the university. I've seen lots of changes. I'm very happy where I am at the moment and Massey University is a good place to be. You know, we're going through changes like a lot of other institutions, but generally got great colleagues, very energetic, young group of people that I work with, um, keep me on my toes. And uh, yes, yeah, and I can see myself continuing for, you know, quite a while still. So I, it does, probably doesn't quite answer your question, but I think if someone said flip a coin at, or someone said you can choose to, to change your life, I wouldn't change it now. I would have got done the same thing now. But there were certainly times, I think, during my career when I thought I probably should be doing something different. Thank you, Majid, for that question. Uh, we're almost running out of time. So if somebody has a pressing question, Rubini, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Susan. It's an amazing presentation and uh, very thank inspiring. You. Um, particularly I'm a mid-career academic. I'm from RMIT University in Melbourne. Um, so you raised a very important point there that um, underrepresentation of women leading major grants. So um, do you have any advice to professional bodies like CIB having a central role in this um, sort of canvas of linking uh, all the parties together, stakeholders together. Do you think CIB has a role in there to develop uh, leadership programs or some kind of a um, strategic activity in space? Well, the short answer would be yes. I think that would be um, a great thing for CIB to start working on because I think you could support mid-career staff to go into say horizon bids or you could support them to be part of the Australian bidding system. The thing about so so I so I've used CIB members into my into my grants that I've bid it, uh, I've put bids in as international advisors. And that that's they've always been people have always been keen to be part of that. I think the wider question about encouraging women to bid there's more of a wider question there about how do we get how do we ensure that women are bidding into those major grants and have the support and confidence of their colleagues to do that and there's probably a bit of work to do in the institutions maybe in maybe RMIT is good I don't know but certainly I've seen some institutions never pay any attention to that and we should be we should be kind of bringing all our mid-career staff into positions where they can 
apply for major grants and they're supported by the institutions to do that. So some of the things we've been doing at Massey more recently is putting grant writers with um, with our staff members. So we're basically repairing them up with people who know the grant system and we'll be able to help them navigate the system. And we pay for these people to work alongside our academics. And we say, we think this is a grant, a million dollar grant or a $10 million dollar grant that you should be going for. Here's some support and they will help you work out what you need, including what connections you might need to support you in writing that. And we're having some success in that. We're not having full success, but the bidding system is so weird anyway, but we're having at least some success in confidence building and having bids that can be used for multiple grants as well. So having a kind of base this is what I do, this is what the bid is about, this is what the pro pro project is about. How do we put it to multiple places to maximize the chances of it being successful? So those are some of the some of the things we're doing. It's not gendered, it's kind of to both, to anybody who comes forward and we're, we're actively promoting that. But, but I've been encouraging women in particular to apply because I had noticed that a lot was, were not applying or were second or third you know on on a bid including myself i've done that myself i've been happy to sit back and be third on a bid that i would prefer somebody else to to run so i think it's just um it's just about knowing that that you can do something about it thank, thank you, you very much uh we, we have just about a minute uh anybody else has a pressing question please uh Raise your hand or open your mic. All right. Well, as I always do, let me ask my last question then. <laughs> and uh, so, Suzanne, thank you again. For this. this has been a very uh, exciting and very wonderful uh, presentation. And we really appreciate you taking time early in the morning uh, <laughs> for uh, making this this uh, presentation. But, uh, you know, you, you mentioned... Uh, number of uh, mentors really who's who a list of who's who that that you have had uh, the advantage of having interacted with uh, you know uh, will smith roger flanagan martin skidmore and and the uh, uh, and the list goes on how what would you uh, advise you know young researchers upcoming researchers uh, the role of mentoring and and what they should do in that regard yeah, I mean, to me, it was kind of pretty critical to have mentors. And I don't think these people would have said that they were mentoring. I, uh, they, I think they were just doing, they were just being nice and kind and interested in what I was doing. But if, but I think it's more to the senior academics, you know, that showing an interest in somebody's project and following through with a, how you're doing, or I saw that paper, actually makes such a difference to a younger staff member because they feel that they're on the right track sometimes it can be very lonely and you you know as you know yourself you know you follow up a, an idea for a while and you're on your own and um and I think that that's when senior staff and CIB is great for that because it's an opportunity they have lots and lots of different activities throughout the year and it's an opportunity for senior staff to kind of give back and say, hey, you know, I can help this person in my field who's, you know, doing this stuff and I'm really interested in. But it's also a good for younger, younger staff to see that there's people who are willing to help. And, and those people change, you know, like when Martin Skidmore moved to QUT, you know, I was probably one of the first person people to email him saying, great, you're over here, right, I'm coming over to QUT. And I spent a couple of you know, sabbaticals, you know, just par parts of sabbaticals in QUT, just so that I could go and chat with him. Because UK was obviously, and when I went back to the UK on trips, I would try and see people, but it wasn't always possible because it's a holiday and I'm trying to see family. But certainly, you know, that kind of, that kind of mentorship or giving back. And then as mentoring for younger people, just looking for those people in your field it doesn't have to be in your institution um and you, you you'll find people who are willing and they may not be 
for professors. They may be associate professors that want to develop their international network and you you become part of that. And so you become part of their, you know, cohort. And as you go through, you know, that 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 network, you'll work, you'll start working with with people. And I'm seeing that more with our Massey staff who are quite junior, a lot of them. So they are making those connections and being encouraged to make those connections. And the mentoring spread more broadly. It's not, I've got a mentor and that mentor is helping me. It's much better to have a broader canvas of people to work with that you you get different things from, different ideas from. Thank you, Suzanne. That, that's a great piece of advice. Uh, and with, with that said, I want to thank you one once more mm -hmm. for thank taking you. time. And uh, this has been really exciting uh, with all the questions and, and, uh, and the responses. You can see that uh, this is quite a bit of interest uh, to, to the audience. So thank you again. Well, so, thank and you thanks, very much. And thanks to all, the, all those who are in the audience for uh, staying with us throughout the seminar. And, uh, uh, you know, our series continues. I look forward to next week. And we, we are going to have Professor uh, Ruvini Edri Singe, uh, she's in the audience today as well, uh, is going to be one of our speakers uh, uh, next Friday. So please stay tuned, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. So thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.